Hello and welcome to Driven by Doing podcast. Today we have Michael Romrel, one of the co-founder for Literal App. Michael, welcome to the show. Well, thanks. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So you have got a wealth of entrepreneurial experience and definitely wanted to deep dive into your story, how you got into entrepreneurship and where you are today. So going back to your college days, tell us a little bit more about where you are from and how did you get into entrepreneurship, first of all? Uh, sure. So I think the bug for entrepreneurship hit me actually in high school. Uh, the end of my, I think my senior year in high school, I took a, an internship with a uh, mechanical engineering firm. Uh, that was my initial intent was to go off and do electrical engineering, uh, electrical mechanical engineering and build robots. And uh, so I took this internship and what I realized the company was so small, uh, there was about seven employees total and I got a chance to kind of see how everything ran. And that actually became really interesting to me. Um, just watching the owner kind of go through a guy named Fred Smith at Alpine Engineering and Design. Um, just watching him build that business and, and grow that. And that's sort of where it started. And um, yeah, so from there, one of the things that they had asked me to do was build him a website, which I said I could do. Uh, not that I actually could, but uh, I said, sure, I can do that. And so I just jumped in and started doing it. And uh, eventually that led to kind of a whole career that uh, we can sort of dive into if you're interested. But Sure. So, so you took that first opportunity when somebody asked you, hey, create that website for you. At that time, do you know how to create a website or you, did you just tell yourself, hey, I could figure this out? No, I'm a fake it till you make it kind of guy. So, uh, in fact, I have, I've had a lot of opportunities in my career that I did not deserve. Um, so, uh, opportunities that, you know, kind of came my way and I could have just said, no, I, I have no idea how to do that. But instead I said, sure, I can do that. And then I would go home and I would cram like crazy and read like crazy and study like crazy so I could come back the next day or the next week and just uh, fake my way like I knew what I was talking about. Um, and I have, that's just process has worked really well for me. So, so. it was amazing that uh, you're, you're telling that in interesting journey, uh, Michael, because one of the common problems that we see everywhere is, is self-doubt. That, hey, could I do it? Could I not learn it? Like there are a lot of questions that naturally people ask us, right? Whenever we, we get this opportunity, new opportunity or a kind of role that you might be interested in, but you are not really sure whether you can do the job or not. And a lot of times, I believe that was the biggest thing that stops a lot of people from actually trying it. Do you think that was the main reason that you see a lot of people not really taking that chance? Yeah, so I, I think absolutely. Um, and here's what I've found that's been interesting about the self-doubt side of things. That never goes away. Uh, and you talk to incredibly successful entrepreneurs, which you have done, and you will find that that self-doubt is always there. Um, the difference is, I think you learn how to work around that and how to not let it stop you. Uh, but the fact that you, you know, recognize that you're in a position that you've never been in before and you're not sure the answer, that's self-doubt, and that never ever goes away unless you just stop pushing yourself. Uh, so I think just recognizing that you're in that position and recognizing, hey, I've pushed through things before and I'm, I'll push through it again. Wow. So that was amazing. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Michael. And now coming back to your college days, again, you took that uh, opportunity in entrepreneurship. Now, did you figure that at that point, say, hey, like I wanted to build a business and I need this business degree. What was that story? Yeah, I I, at that point, didn't really take college seriously. I went just because you're supposed to go, um, not because I was told to go, not because I felt like I needed to. In fact, at that point, I had the misleading concept that, you know, you don't need a business degree uh, to do entrepreneurship. Um, and so I did not push myself to go to a prestigious school. Um, and, you know, there are pros and cons to that, and we'll kind of talk about that, I'm sure. But uh, I basically went in and said, hey, I, I've built a couple websites now. I'm going to go see if I can do this professionally, because what I really want to do is just snowboard all day. Um, that was really what I wanted to do. And so I needed a job that would let me work around that. 
And uh, in fact, my senior year of high school, I had 63 absences the last half of the semester. So that was from uh, different classes because I was snowboarding um, as often as I possibly could. And I had really developed, and this worked for my advantage in college as well. Uh, in college, I would specifically sign up for courses that I would go into class, I would look at the syllabus, and I would kind of count things up and say, okay, if I don't turn in any assignments, but only come in for the tests, will I pass this class? Because I knew that I could cram for, you know, two, three hours, uh, or, you know, a day before a big test, and consistently get an A minus, B plus. Um, I wouldn't remember anything, but I, I could do it. And so that's how I based my whole college experience was, uh, let's just go and take the test and uh, be really effective on my time. And that allowed me to go snowboard. That allowed me to then build up my uh, consultancy where I was uh, building custom websites for businesses around the valley. So for those of you who are wondering, where in the world is Michael? He's talking about snowboarding. So tell us a little bit about where you are and uh, like, you know, why you love uh, snowboarding. Yeah, so I'm in Utah. So Utah is, uh, you know, the best place to be for snow. Uh, it's just an amazing place. And I was really good at finding extremely cheap deals on season passes. So, um, in fact, so in high school, you could get a season pass. They had high school passes for like 100 bucks. That was great. And then when I graduated, um, I realized I had to still, you know, sustain my snowboarding addiction. And so I realized they had this college, uh, what they call it, a college rep program. So basically, if you were in college, you could go and sign up 10 friends. And for every 10 friends you signed up, you would get a free season pass. And I thought, well, this is, this sounds golden. And so I set up, uh, I would spend like 50 bucks a year on uh, pay-per-click ads that I would run just Google pay-per-click ads. And I set up a dinky little website that said, Hey, sign up for, uh, get a you know discounted college pass. And I sold, you know, I, I would sold, sell 40 or 50 of those. Um, and then, so I'd get a free pass for me. I'd get a free pass for some of my friends and it was awesome. And so that's how I, uh, that's how I did awesome. that. <laughs> Michael, like you took every opportunity for, for whatever you love. I think that's amazing. That was one of the qualities for, being an entrepreneur, I guess. And then you also mentioned about fake it until you make it. Like, you no, know, try to figure everything out because the day one, you don't know what to, what to do and how to do. But you mentioned that how you kind of like nail it down to, hey, like you know, I, I study, I work hard and I, I try to figure it out. I think that's the kind of uh, attitude uh, I see like every entrepreneur has that, that growth mindset and constantly trying to learn to, to try to figure out. And if not, just ask people for help because a lot of times we are also afraid for asking for help. And that might be something <laughs> that we need to overcome as entrepreneurs as well, because there are a lot of people who wanted to help as well. So what do you think about that? I mean, that, yeah, the asking for help piece is critical. Um, you know, I, I have this, this thing that I often say, you know, you look around and there can be a lot of critique sometimes for uh, the children of wealthy parents, right? And you think, ah, you know, those, the, the rich parents kind of gave them everything, right? Um, and it is unfortunate because there is an opportunity gap uh, that occurs and where, you know, wealthy families continue to, those children continue to have wealth and success. And it's because the opportunity is there for some and it's not there for others. But what I mean by that is uh, you talked about asking for help. And when you are surrounded by people that have been successful, that have done it in the past, um, that number one, just becomes your normal. Uh, that becomes, you know, well, that's what I do. And number two, you've got immediate resources uh, to turn to for help and assistance. And so, I, you know, my family was not wealthy by any means uh, when we uh, were growing up. And so um, I definitely had to look for uh, for mentors in the, the wealth and success space uh, to kind of coach me through, right? I was lucky enough to have just amazing parents that were my awesome guides and mentors for all things personal and, uh, and other attributes. But from the success standpoint, I really had to go look for those folks. And, um, you know, when you find them, they're just wildly, wildly helpful. Um, and you just love them like family. So... 
at that early age, uh, Michael, like how did you figure out that, hey, I need a mentor at that stage to kind of like really help me? Because sometimes people might be wondering, hey, like now who is that guy who is going to help me uh, in, in my career and life? Yeah, you know, having a good mentor is, uh, I, I think it's a sort of a nebulous idea uh, until you actually have a good one, right? Um, you may look at people around you, you may be able to, you know, convince someone that you can take them out to lunch and pick their brain. And that's awesome. And that's helpful. Um, and that's sort of where I started and coasted for a lot of years was just talking with people, meeting with them and, you know, trying to take them out and, and get to know them a little bit better. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, much later that I think I really came across a couple of just really good mentors, people that really truly were there with my best interest in mind that wanted to sit down and wanted to help and wanted to give me time. But I, I think the reason that I didn't find, um, you know, mentors like that until later in life was because I don't think that I had developed the skills early on to give those mentors what they were after as well. Um, if that makes any sense. So, uh, you know, no one wants to just give their time to a time suck all day long, right? Uh, they're there because they, they get joy out of watching people grow. They get uh, satisfaction out of um, helping people reach their dreams and their, and if you're just taking people out to lunch and just picking their brain, um, that's awesome. But are you giving back to that mentor? Are you providing them with the incentives that they've got in their own uh, life and, and process. And that took me a long time, I think, to really understand. Um, that's a great point, uh, Michael, because uh, that's true. Uh, in fact, because when they are pouring their time and effort uh, into us, sometimes they see, they wanted to see those results because to get those results, ultimately we are the ones who need to work hard to really get that going, isn't it? Yeah. So now again, after that, after your like no really good stint in like creating websites for these like no your clients, and then you went to Spain to get your MBA. Tell us like no what were you thinking at that stage of your career? Hey, like no get, getting an MBA can like no really help me uh, where I wanted to go next. Yeah, well, so that getting to that point uh, took some time actually. So. You know, in my undergrad, between snowboarding and uh, essentially being a freelance web developer, uh, I got better and better at web development. And I realized I was building these really great sites, but didn't know how to get people there. And so, you know, the other thing that I decided to do was go out and get a job, um, which I think is, is a, another critical misunderstanding with a lot of uh, early students that want to be entrepreneurs. They think, you know what, I'm just going to go do it. Uh, I'm not going to go get the job experience. I'm just going to go do it. And there's a lot of value in going out and working for other people uh, to get those skills, right? You get paid to learn the skills. And I took a job as employee number five at a little company called Boostability here in the Valley. And uh, I was lucky enough to be there when the company just sort of exploded. Uh, in you know, four years, they had made the Inc. 5000 fastest growing companies. Um, I was came in as a sales rep and uh, they had then soon asked me to help build up their business development department. And so I was responsible for going out and getting, getting a lot of the strategic partners in that helped to grow that business. And uh, my partners at, by the time that I eventually left, I think we had almost 300 employees. Um, my partners were bringing in about 60% of the revenue and it was, you know, an awesome experience. And it was totally one of those areas where um, because we were a startup and because we were moving fast, they gave me opportunities that I totally didn't deserve, uh, career opportunities. Uh, I got to lead some large teams. I got to lead a big product team um, and become a product manager. And all of these skills that I got along the way uh, became so useful down the road. Um, I... I then decided I had made a great friend there um, named Mike Smith, and he and I decided that we were going to leave and start uh, an agency, a proper agency uh, called 210, which we did. And uh, we were lucky enough to build that and grow that and uh, take on some really great uh, clients like uh, Culver's, uh, Planet Fitness, a uh, large mining operation out of Australia. Um, we had 
you know, just some fantastic uh, opportunities there to grow and develop and, and really get our feet wet in the entrepreneur space, right? Because prior to that, I had done a lot of freelancing and that's a great place to start. Um, but it really kind of helped to uplevel my, my entrepreneurial skills uh, at 21 zero. Um, so from there, and I'm, I'll get to the MBA here. <laughs> so from there, I was picked up by a recruiter uh, who was looking to fill a, a position at a company up in Salt Lake uh, as one of their directors. And uh, it just seemed like a great opportunity. The timing was right. And so I joined up there as an employee uh, to, again, just up-level my skills. Um, I needed to better understand what a startup looked like at a at kind of that next stage. And um, it was there that I... I it was an amazing, amazing company. They had some of the best benefits around. I got a uh, 40 to 70% off of pretty much any outdoor equipment I wanted. So my snowboarding gear really, you know, You're expanded at that point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Um, you know, but I, I had a boss that, uh, you know, to put it lightly, we did not see eye to eye on a lot of things. And so I knew very quickly that I was not going to be there for very long. Um, and so that is when I decided I needed to go do an MBA. That's sort of when I decided, okay, I, I have now had enough experience in, as an employee to look around and see the opportunities that were available for students that decided to really push themselves to, and go to a really nice prestigious college, as opposed to those like myself, my undergrad, uh, who just, you know, said, I'm going to take the lazy local college route. Um, and uh, so I decided I, I really wanted to go do a, a fantastic prestigious college. And um, there's a couple things I can talk about on, on that aspect. But, you know, nowadays, when I talk to people, when people ask me if they should take the time to go to college, right, they want to be an entrepreneur. So why, why go get a degree? that helps you get a job when your whole mission is to go not have a job, right? Um, and here's what I would say to that. College, it, under no circumstances, uh, no matter what major you're majoring in, college is not designed to get you a job. That is not what college does. And if you go into it with that mentality, you're going to miss out on everything that college actually is. So college in my mind is, a platform for opportunity. It's a platform for you to create opportunity for yourself. And that's really what it is. Um, it's a place where you go and you meet people. It's a place where you go and you see challenges. It's a place where you go and you build out a portfolio, right? But in order to take advantage of college, okay, it's not, it's not necessarily about, um, you know, the, the classes you take or the grades you get it is about the opportunities that you take, right? Um, and, and we could spend a whole podcast, I'm sure, talking about the opportunities that are there in college. But that is really my philosophy on schooling. When, and so that's when I decided, like, I needed to do a top-ranked school because the opportunities at a top-ranked school, hands down, are bigger, better, and more abundant than they are at your local state university. So, so then you, you, you went on to do your uh, MBA from Spain. So is there any consideration that you took into uh, when you're deciding on that school, like, you know, whether it is yeah. it has to be in the U.S. or you wanted to get that global experience going outside U.S. Uh, at that uh, instant? Well, I basically said, look, I, I want to do, if nothing else, I want to do a top 20 MBA, right? And I want to do top 20, not just in the U.S., I want to do top 20 in the world. And I started looking around and of course, you know, there's Harvard and Stanford and, uh, you know, some of the big ones here in the U.S. But I started recognizing that Spain actually had three of the top 20 MBA programs in the world. And uh, particularly, I started looking at ISADE in Barcelona, uh, which outranked a lot of the big schools here in the U.S. And I thought, man, this sounds amazing. Um, I had previously lived for two years in Panama um, as a missionary, actually. And so I already knew the language. Um, my wife and my three girls at the time um, did not, but you know, 
they said, hey, we're up for the challenge. And um, so that was one of the schools that we decided to go to. But uh, in order to get into a top 20, I had to score really well on the GMAT. And the GMAT kicked my butt. I studied for the GMAT for probably, probably two years. And I took it four times. Um, and it was super, super frustrating because I would study and study and study and I take these practice tests and I would do super well. So I'd go in for the real test. And if you're familiar with the GMAT, there's a uh, math score. If I, I'm probably messing this up right now. There's like a math score and a verbal score. Um, and basically I would score really high on one and then just really low on the other, right? Um, and then, so that sucked. So I'd go home and I would study again for months. And then a uh, practice test would say, all right, you're ready to score high again. So I would go in and then I'd score really low on this one, but then really high on this one, which was super frustrating uh, because I was spending hours and hours studying. I was neglecting my family. Uh, I was you know, about ready to throw in the towel, but I said, all right, I'm going to keep doing this. So I went in a third time. And once again, this score was up, this score was down. So my scores flip-flopped again. And, uh, you know, just super frustrating as you can imagine. So I finally went in a fourth time and got both scores up, uh, which, which allowed me to uh, really start applying to some of these top universities. That's which, awesome, uh, Michael. Uh, never, like you did not ever give up on that thought. Like, hey, like, you know, why is this happening? I'm getting great scores when I'm practicing it. And every time I think uh, you have always uh, came over that. And I think it's fantastic uh, how you got there. And like, what was your experience now that you got your admission and going, uh, like, you know, went to Spain? What was your overall experience looked like uh, back there? It was incredible. It was incredible, right? So if you ever get the opportunity to go live abroad, go do it. Uh, one of the things I, so I lead uh, a youth group here of uh, about uh, age 16 to 18 or so. And I tell all of them, if you get an opportunity, like make an opportunity, not if you get it, not if it comes your way go make an opportunity to go study overseas. Because, you know, when you live abroad and you live among people that are from all over the world, and I was like one of, I think there were maybe 12 Americans out of the 80 or 90 uh, students that were in there. Everyone else was from all over. Um, and man, it just really opens up your perspective and your love of people, right? I think travel is the best cure to racism by far. And it was just amazing for me to take my daughters. Uh, you know, we come from Utah, which, you know, has, there's not a lot of diversity here in the state, um, both, you know, culturally and ethnically. And so it was great to take my daughters, put them in Spain, just shove them into school where they didn't know the language. And they picked it up so fast. And they had friends from just everywhere, from all different religions and all different places. And it was just a beautiful, amazing experience. And we were so happy to, to have that. That was fantastic, uh, Michael. I think a lot of listeners are going to like, you know, listen to your advice and take every opportunity to go anywhere in the world to get that experience because that's the same thing that happened to me. I'm originally from India, came here as an international student five years ago, and it was a fantastic journey since then. Like, you know, learned a lot and met so many great people and so many have, people have mentored me and poured into me, uh, which uh, is, is just amazing uh, for me. And I definitely want to give back uh, to this community, which really helped me uh, grow in my yeah, career and life. And you get to meet so many awesome people that are going to become friends for your life. And these are some of the experiences, as you rightly mentioned, is the best cure for racism with a lot of things that are going on, especially we are seeing a lot of things uh, that's going on uh, in, the, in the recent uh, months that, like, you know, we are seeing a lot of these things, but I think uh, at the same time, uh, we have got a great opportunity to, to really help each other and also like, you know, help each other to grow I think that's what uh, it, it meant to be here. Uh, so to like, you know, really help each other out and uh, how can we be that potential change? So thanks for sharing that, uh, your journey uh, in an MBA. I'm sure like a lot of people are going to take your advice. Now coming to your literal app experience, I know that you also had uh, some experience in the, uh, the venture capital. So tell us a little bit of, of uh, like, you know, after your MBA again, you came back to the United States and then were you looking for a job or like, you know, were you looking for a startup to join? So I actually went into the MBA with, and the reason I did the MBA in the first place was because I said, all right, I need to be uh, a legitimate candidate for investors, right? I want investors. 
I know I'm going to go out and raise money one day and I want investors to see that I, I had this good MBA on my record. And there I learned about um, search funds and I'm not sure if you're super familiar with search funds what they are and how they work, but it's essentially an awesome vehicle and way for entrepreneurs who are in their MBA program or coming out of their MBA program to raise money from investors and you take that money and you fund your search for two years so that your salary and all the expenses you need for up to two years for you to go out and search for a business to buy. So you buy, you acquire this company uh, in part with capital from investors and uh, part debt finance and you run it as a CEO, you run it, you grow it, and then eventually you sell it. And that's the model, right? And everyone gets a return. It's really an incredible model, really cool, often called uh, entrepreneurship through acquisition. Harvard is really big into this. Stanford's really big into this. Um, in fact, if you search on Stanford's websites, they've got, just search for uh, search funds, and they've got just fantastic resources that walk you through this. And so this, that was my plan. Uh, was to raise this search fund and go out, search for, find a company to buy, grow it, build it. And uh, I was really pumped about this. I uh, became the, the uh, entrepreneur president, uh, entrepreneurship club president at the uh, school there. And that was one of my big focuses. So one of the things I realized though, is that the market to do that was really, there are entrepreneurs that are doing this all over the world, uh, but the market for me to be the most successful was actually back in the US, which was frankly a little unfortunate for me because I really wanted to stay abroad. Um, but I decided uh, that's, what, that's where I needed to be. And so upon graduating, I came back to the US and started doing the circuit and started traveling uh, to different US cities, meeting with uh, investors that I had met at these different conferences, um, different search fund conferences and, and just working with them and started raising uh, capital for that. And at some point I was back in Spain and I realized that the running of the bulls was coming up in Pamplona. And, you know, you live in Spain, you got to go do running of the bulls. And so I, I kind of was asking around and I, I reached out to a friend of mine who is also an American, a, a friend that I had met there at Bar in Barcelona, uh, a guy named Lawton Smith. And I said, hey, Lawton, do you want to go run with the bulls with me? And he's like, yeah, man. He says, I've been here for like three years and I've never done that yet. Um, and so, so we get another friend, a third friend who's a local who has, he's done it like eight times. He's like, yeah, I'll show you the ropes. It's, it's amazing. And so we get in the car and it's like a six hour drive to get up to Pamplona. And 3 a.m. we're driving, our buddies passed out in the back. And Lawton just leans over to me and he's like, dude, I have this idea. I haven't been able to put it down for like two years. And this, this is the idea. And he lays out what is now literal. Um, and, you know, you can learn more about it at literalapp.com. But he lays out this concept for how to make books, like actual books that are 500 years old, right? How do you make these as addictive as being on social media, right? How do you get an entirely new generation of kids who are not reading, by the way, reading is like massively on the decline and has been for the last 40 years. How do you get them hooked on books when they're hooked on their phones? And uh, so the, the high level concept was you take a book exactly as the author wrote it. You don't change the content at all. You just change the formatting and you put a book in a group chat format. So like the narrator is chatting, the, all the characters are coming in and it just comes like a group chat. Like all these characters are in here just chatting and you read it like a text message. And anyways, as we were walk, as we were going through this on the drive, it was just blowing my mind in terms of what we could do with this and what this meant. Um, and that's when, as I say a lot and sort of derailed my life uh, <laughs> and taking me from this, this goal that I had had for the last two years of doing a search fund and saying, you know what, let's do a startup instead. Uh, so that was very unique story. How uh, both you, you met Lawton uh, back in Spain uh, doing your MBA and then uh, Lawton shares this idea and 
how excited are you guys both at that time hey guys like now we have this idea what were your initial thoughts when lorden said hey like you no know, let's let's go and build this i just i was so pumped like instantly right he didn't have to convince me on the power of the idea um you know i i recognized that we all have this desire to read more right even if you don't read books you wish you read more books it's like going to the gym right you don't go to the maybe you don't go to the gym but everyone wishes they went to the gym right everyone it's aspirational right smart people read more uh your mother would be really proud of you if you read more uh but we just don't do it cuz we don't make the time for it uh, but we do spend <laughs> ridiculous amounts of time i found out later on average 86% of high school seniors spend an average of 6 hours a day in text messaging and social media on their phone 6 hours a day wow and that's why they don't read and english teachers all across the us um and elsewhere are not assigning books anymore they they don't have to go home and read books because they just know kids aren't doing it they can barely get them to do it in class And so the opportunity was just huge. The fact that no one else was doing this, that this wasn't going to be like a me too product, um was just so exciting for me as he was laying this out. And you know, he, he kind of gave me the basic concept and I was I just ran with it. I was like, "Oh, and you could do this. And what about this? And it could solve this problem." And uh it was just really an incredible ride. Um and it has been <laughs> kind of ever since then. So It's awesome, uh, Michael. So where, where do you guys both now like now you guys have an idea that you guys both are pumped about now what are those next steps because as an entrepreneur like yes we all got these ideas but it's very hard to execute but you guys made it right what is like lay down that story after that what happened yeah so uh i mean the next day we woke up in the park uh because that's where we decided to sleep and then we went and we ran with the bulls and we barely survived and it was amazing and then we just started running from there uh with literal and we basically so it was it was almost 2 years ago uh today actually uh probably in about 2 weeks we're about 2 years ago exactly from when we decided that we were really going to kick this thing off and um i said look i i've got a development background i can code this uh you know you run it let's let's do this So we kind of shook hands and we we got to work and Lawton had at that point he had already sort of built out this this mock up of the idea which you know because we need to test it we need to test this with people and so what he did is he took a handful of books and he took like the first chapter of like Romeo and Juliet and he created fake Facebook accounts for Juliet and for Romeo and for whoever right and then he would log in to each account separately get them all in on a, a Facebook Messenger chat and then write out manually one sentence at a time back and forth back and forth and so he had created like the first chapter or scene of Romeo and Juliet in this format in Facebook Messenger and that was what we started taking around and started showing people and saying hey would you know would you read a book in this format what what does this do for you like what are your feelings what are your thoughts and we just started learning from people um and i i will say you know step 1 in starting a business the number one thing everyone wants to do is go out and build something right because it's it's fun uh stop 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 get out of the building okay go test this go user test it go interview it like crazy uh start using apps like indesign and um or invision excuse me invision and these other mockup apps build out a mockup test it out first before you build anything because the ideas that you have in your head in the beginning no matter how sure you are no matter how much industry knowledge you have you're wrong you're wrong until your customers tell you that you are right and so that was step 1 for us was just going and validating this idea and so we got enough and we were talking to everyone just you know any anywhere i was if i was standing in line at you know the sandwich shop i would pull out my phone and just tap someone on the shoulder and say hey excuse me i you know I, i'm just curious here what you think about this and so we just got all these different thoughts and and feedback from there we took what we had learned and i said okay i'm going to make i'm going to take what we've learned and do some things that we can't do in face that we can't fake in facebook messenger and uh so i quickly coded up 
this uh, initial version of one of the books. Um, I don't remember which one we started with, but um, it may have been Pride and Prejudice, actually. Um, I coded this up in uh, PHP. Uh, just It was a real quick and dirty little concept. And uh, then we started shopping that around and started getting more bits of feedback, more learnings, and um, started improving it little by little. And we said, all right, this is, we're getting a lot of positive feedback, which is actually really concerning for me. I was, I was worried that we were not getting enough negative feedback. And that should be worrisome for you. It, it really generally means, A, you're not asking the right questions. B, your audience size is not big enough. Um, and so, you know, I thought, all right, well, let's, let's widen this up. So we saw that there was a Utah English teacher conference coming up. And just a little conference. There was going to be about 600 folks there. Uh, I think, actually, I think there were about 400 English teachers here in Utah that were going to be there. And so we took this little PHP mock-up that I had made. Uh, it looked real, looked legit, but on the back end, like it was, it was garbage. And we took this, we set up a screen, and in four hours, we had signed up 50% of the conference. And, you know, what were they signing up for? We said, well, you know, come sign up. We'll, we're basically taking pre-registrations and we'll let you know as soon as it's ready. And we signed up 50% of the conference, which is pretty dang good considering, you know, the books that we had were really only useful for half the audience that was there. Four hours and we, it was about 200 teachers that represented about 30,000 students that said, I want this, I need this, like this solves a massive problem. And so, from there, we took that, that little rinky dinky concept. And I realized at that point, like I had to throw away everything I had built because it was not, it was not gonna scale. And that's, that's exactly what you should do. Like don't build things that are gonna scale right away. Build junky throwaway stuff uh, until you know it's gonna work. And so I scrapped everything and I came out with, um, uh, started coding with uh, Python and Django. And, and I, I should back up here. I, so, I taken that job with Boostability several years ago, right? And helped build their sales team, their business dev team. When I left, right before, right after I left and right before starting 21.0, I did a boot camp, uh, a dev boot camp, because I had already, I've been coding front end for years, right? So I knew how to do that, but I really wanted to improve my back end skills. And so again, this going back to the importance of school, like I decided, I, I didn't want a computer science degree because I didn't want to waste all my time doing that. I just wanted to get down and dirty. I wanted to learn the basics. I wanted to build. And so that's what I did. If you've got the aptitude to code and you're interested in it, I highly recommend a boot camp. Uh, but so that's where I'd learned Python and Django and learned the back end side of things. And so uh, I you know, worked those skills at 21.0. Now flash, flash forward to literal, right? A year and a half ago. And um, so that's when I started building this out on the platform that it is in today. And we then took, we had an MVP ready. Let's see, I think we had the, so, so let's see, we ran with the bowls in like September, if my memory is correct. We had, we did the Facebook mock-up for the, until like October, October, I built the PHP version. Uh, in November, we took it to the English teacher conference. And then in March, was South by Southwest. So if you're familiar with South by Southwest, it's a huge conference in Austin, Texas, and they've got an education specific uh, version of that event. And so, you know, it was like 2000 bucks to set up a booth there. And we had obviously no money. We really had no product, but we, I worked really well under pressure. And so we decided, all right, we're going to give ourselves a deadline and we're going to hit it. We're going to go to South by Southwest. We're going to make it happen. And so that's what we decided to do. And I had to code this whole thing um, from basically, well, from nothing to uh, an MVP in like two or three months. And so that's what we did. And we went in March and we had this amazing show and we had signed up about 80, let's see, what was it? I think it was about 80,000 students through their educators, right? So their educators came to our booth, their educators saw it, they just fell in love and, uh, and, you know, it was amazing. And one of the fun things, little side note, that we had one of the most attractive booths there, uh, which was interesting because we had zero money. And so what we ended up doing was renting from Amazon. Um, so 
you know, so we had our credit cards out and we got this amazing short throw projector and this big screen and, and I went to Fiverr and got this great, you know, video done up for almost nothing. And then uh, you, it was, it attracted tons of people. And then at the end, we ended up returning everything and our costs were pretty low. So that was amazing, uh, Michael, uh, how you, how you got that. And now you got this early traction that like, you know, what were, what were you and uh, Lawton were thinking at that after Southwest Southwest? Like, no, do you guys want to raise from some funding to like, no, really go after this now? What were you guys uh, doing after that? Yeah, so that was pretty much exactly it. We thought, all right, well, we, we have shown that there's a market here. We've shown that there's a demand here. We, you know, we don't really have much funds ourselves. We're not wealthy folks. Uh, so let's go raise some money. And we started, we started kind of down that process, but frankly, this is where not having a mentor really hurt you, right? We didn't know what we were doing. We were Googling things, yeah, how to raise money. And it didn't work. And we were meeting with amazing investors who were, you know, gracious and, and helpful, but they basically said, look, you've got nothing. You've got nothing. Come back to us when you've got something. We're like, what do you mean we've got nothing? We've got all these, you know, pre-registrations and we've got this, you know, MVP and, and people want us. And they said, well, you've got nothing, um, which was super frustrating, right? And so, so we go back and, and while we were at South by Southwest, we actually made our very first sale. We, we, we got some money, uh, which was just, yeah, that was incredible. It was an incredible experience uh, to get money for something. And, but the product was, it was so, it just wasn't ready for prime time. And um, so we came back and we just started working on it. And we uh, put some ads out. Uh, Lot and I put some money in, um, you know, in total, you know, I think at that point we'd put $20,000 collectively in of our own money, about half and half. And then, um, you know, we had hired some folks, ultra cheap uh, students that needed a portfolio, that needed some work experience. And we brought them in and they were fantastic. They were awesome, awesome to work with and allowed us to build this product out on the cheap. And, um, and that's what we did for about, gosh, from March when we went to South by Southwest, uh, all the way to the summer. Um, and it, by the summertime, we were still pouring more of our own money into this and just wonder what was going on. Like we, we, didn't, we knew nothing about how to sell into education. Like we have sales backgrounds, but in completely different industries and education, selling into education is notoriously difficult. It is the difficult thing. And that was actually my uh, next question. Like you know, getting into education, that's exactly where uh, I was in. Like I was creating this ed tech startup and not knowing that education is the toughest field to yeah. actually to sell it to. What was your experience and like, you know, who helped you uh, navigate the journey? So I, this is where you've got to just be humble. You've got to, you've got to swallow your pride. Right. And, and every entrepreneur should not have pride, right? It, you're a startup. Great. whoop do you do? Go get help. Go ask for help. Um, and I did. And I started asking around. I said, look, I need to talk to people who are in education sales because we clearly know nothing. And so I started asking around and uh, met with a few folks. Some people made some introductions, took some people out to lunch um, and started kind of learning a few things. Uh, met with this ed tech founder here who's like, I hate ed tech. It's the worst. I've been in it for 30 years. He says, I, I just, I hate it. It's don't do it. It sucks. And I was like, oh, okay, that's encouraging. And um, and then I got an intro uh, of uh, CEO of Wooly um, reached out and he said, hey, you need to talk to Darren Hill. Um, and I said, okay, make an intro. And so he made an intro and I go down uh, about a week later to go meet with this guy named Darren Hill. Um, and I meet him at his office and we're there and we're talking and he's just, you know, very gracious and listening. And it turns out Darren had run, he had been the founder of a company called Imagine Learning which, uh, you know, was news to me. Like I, I'd heard of Imagine Learning. My kids had come home every day, you know, talking about, oh, we love Imagine Learning. It's so much fun. I'm like, okay, that's cool. And then here's the guy who had created it. And he is listening intently. And, and, you know, at the end, he's kind of coaching me through some thoughts and some processes to think about and, and you know, how I might want to approach this. And, and our time was up. And I said, I said, hey, thank you so much for your time. And I, I really appreciate it. I, and I, I'm sorry, because I, I'm looking around here and I'm realizing as I'm just blabbering about my business, like you've got something here. What is this? What are you doing? And, 
uh, you know, he had, he had long sold uh, Imagine Learning and uh, had done quite well with that. And he had gotten a group of just amazing people together and he, they started a company called Rev Road. And Rev Road is a venture services firm. Uh, so they don't do venture capital, right? They, they take in portfolio companies and instead of giving them money and capital, they give them services. And so he starts showing me around some of the other portfolio companies that are in the space and uh, kind of some of the things they can do. And they, he said, yeah, we've got a dev team here that can give you hours of dev time. We've got uh, a sales team. We've got a legal team. We've got a fundraising team. We've got all these things. And uh, he said, you know, you should consider applying to our program. I was like, yeah. And I was like this, okay. So, you know, I took some flyers and I went home and I was just so, you know, Darren struck me from day one as really an incredible human being. And frankly, we were at the point with literal that I was about done. I was about burned out. We had put in at that point, I think we'd uh, put in about $40,000, uh, maybe about 35 at that point. Um, of our own money. And, you know, we weren't getting a return at, at all. We weren't selling anything. And I basically, you know, I, so I kind of went through the application process and I kind of told my wife, I said, look, we we're about done on our finances. We've got no more money. Um, you know, I think Rev Road can really help us, but if we don't get in, I, I think I'll probably just need to go do something else. We need a win. And, uh, you know, we went through the application process, did the pitch and we got in. And we were, um, so that was October of last year that we got in. And I will tell you what, that, that team, Rev Road, Darren, and the entire team over there, uh, Bart and Bruce and, um, and Amy and everyone, Seth, have been just incredible, incredible mentors. And this is where you get into the realm of what a real mentor can do, right? Uh, you know, taking acquaintances out to lunch once in a while like that's nice but when you get someone that's really invested in you um and they've got real experience backing them it is incredible and so at that point that was october of last year 2019 uh we we came in and we uh got their dev services we got their uh finance services uh capital raising services and their sales services right and so um, we got just hours and hours and hours of their dev team building out our product, taking what I had built and, and adding to it and basically maturing the product to the point that it was actually sellable. Um, and then we got just amazing, incredible sales coaching every single week we meet and we still do. We meet uh, and go over where we're at with sales, what we need. And it's just been a completely complete game changer. And so then coming into this new year in October, um, we had, uh, we, we made our second sale, right? So this was like almost nine months later, we make our second sale and it's, it's for an insignificant amount. I mean, it was a single classroom that was like, yeah, I guess we'll try you out. And, uh, we're like, Oh, thank you. And then, um, and then we go to a, another conference and we crush it. We do so well uh, at this conference. And while we're there, like our booth, we were in the back corner of this booth. Uh, we had zero foot traffic. We should have had zero foot traffic, but we did a little trick to, to drive some traffic. Uh, but while we were there, and while there was this line getting into our booth to sign up for what we were doing, because people were leaving the booth, they were going, grabbing their friends, they were coming back, they were telling them, you've got to see this, you've got to check this out. And this particular conference was all district administrators. So these are the big buyers. These are the guys we really, really want. These aren't teachers. These are the big buyers. And uh, they were just signing up hand and foot. And, um, and we had one uh, superintendent of a district come in and you know she probably was at our booth for a total of 30 seconds. She came running in and she's like, uh, my my staff told me what you guys are doing. This is incredible. She said, can you be in Indiana in, in a month? Um, you know, on this date in particular, can you be there? I, I need you to pitch uh, because we need exactly what you're doing. I was like, yes, of course we can. And uh, anyways, so, you know, flash forward, that ended up being one of our first big district sales. Um, 
yeah, you know, about a month later. And oh, man, I'll tell you what, I felt really, really good, really good. Wow. So, so like you just shared like you know, that big sale, right, uh, Michael? And uh, how did you guys celebrate after that? Like, guys, like you know, we made our like a you know, big sale, and we can just go into other districts. Like, did that help you to get into the other states, uh, just like that after that sale? Yeah, so it, it absolutely does. Education is one of those places where it is a me too game, right? Uh, if you've got someone that you can point to say, hey, we're already working with so-and-so, uh, it is so much easier to close the next deal, right? Um, finding that lighthouse customer in any industry that you're in is super helpful, but education in particular, it's really powerful. Um, and, you know, we, when they, so we flew out to Indiana, uh, again, we had no money, so I put this all on a credit card. And uh, we flew out to Indiana. I took Darren uh, with us, and at that point, we had hired uh, a sales guy um, who, you know, we had hired uh, a guy named Zach Quinn, who is just incredible. Uh, he came at us with basically very. Uh, he had sold Cutco knives. Okay, but he was, he was a super junior dude. Uh, but we could tell when we were talking to him. He was hungry and he was driven and I was like, yeah, you don't have the resume, but dude, you're going to crush it. I can feel it. And so we pulled him in and we, we told him, we said, look, dude, we have no money. We can't, we're going to pay you a terrible, terrible hourly rate. Um, but trust us, it's going to be great and, uh, and we'll make it worth your while. And he did to his credit. He came in uh, to this little team with no money and worked his butt off. And uh, he sold that deal that, you know, that was him that sold that first deal. And uh, anyway, so, so we go out, we meet with them, we meet their, their team, we do this presentation and it was just, it was just awesome. And they, she tells us as she's walking us out, she says, that was great. That was awesome. Basically we're doing this. Um, and we said, awesome. And then we left and, and that was the day, by the way, that was the day on that trip that COVID started happening. That was the day that the NBA canceled their season. That was the day that everyone just started piling on saying COVID, COVID's a real thing. And most of America was saying, wait, what is COVID, right? Um, and that was the day. So she, she senses off and everything's going great. Uh, you know, meanwhile, her, her, the rest of her team was starting to like, wait, we got to do something about this COVID deal. So we go home and we don't hear from them. And we don't hear from them for like two, three months. And at this point, like we needed to raise capital. And so we had started the fundraising side of things. And so we were going around and we were talking uh, with investors and we're like, yeah, we closed this deal. You know, they had sent us a PO. And so we could legitimately say that we'd closed this deal, but you know, the check was perpetually in the mail. And uh, you know, <laughs> we were sweating bullets, sweating bullets. And so they called us and I guess they had sent the check to the wrong address, uh, like twice and it kept getting returned. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, so we finally, the day we got that check, I was through, I took a copy of it. I have a copy sitting on my desk somewhere. Like I have eight copies. I don't even know where I have the eight of them. I was just so happy. I was like, I, I don't want to, I don't want to put this in the bank because it's just, it's so beautiful to look at. This was like, you know, our first five digit check, um, and I was just, I was so thrilled. So I don't know. That's how we celebrated. It was great. Um, it was awesome, Michael. Uh, and, uh, now after that, like, you no, know, you, you got like a few other customers and did you like raise that uh, investment at that point? Yeah. So the investment side was interesting. Um, we, we started off right as COVID kicked off and, you know, the, the, if you'll recall, the stock market at that time just plummeted uh, right away. And so, you know, what investor wants to take their money out of a down market to put into a startup that is still pretty dang unproven, right? That at that point hadn't even had a real check yet. And so fundraising was really hard, um, you know, as it always is. And we... Uh, we just sort of kept at it. And I, I basically said, look, I'm going to stop coding. I'm going to stop developing and I'm just going to focus on fundraising full time. And, you know, we did some pitches and we just, it was, it was really kind of crickets um, fundraising. And we just, we needed to do more when we needed to get things moving because this was another point where, 
you know, I had told my wife, this was before that first check came in. I just told my wife, I said, look, we've got to, we've got to hit some numbers or we've got to move on. And um, so what we did is we decided we're going to change our game plan around investing. And um, I had found at the time a database, an online database that they had scraped the web and they had gotten investor contacts for just thousands and thousands and thousands of investors. And you could search their database and you could filter them down. Like I want the people that are interested in ed tech and I want the people that are interested in, you know, consumer products and whatever. And so you could filter that down. And I think I paid $400 to access this database. And I took those emails and I started doing, you know, these small batch mass camp email campaigns, made them look, made them feel really natural, made them feel one off, uh, just ran that through our CRM and started sending out these emails to these investors and uh, started tweaking things. And I, <laughs> I, you know, I, what I started doing, I started getting, uh, eventually I got 70% open rates. I got uh, like 50% click through rates. I got just incredible numbers on these things. And what I started doing, because when you email, when you do a cold email, like there's a lot to share in a, hey, come, uh, you know, check out this fundraise that's going on, right? And you don't want to overflow them with information. And so what I started doing is I started sending them really the second email first. Uh, and so the second email that I was sending, uh, I made sure to include re, you know, like a reply re in the subject line. And then my first, the first part of that email was, hey, just following up on my last email. Want to make sure you saw that, you know, quick summary. We make books as addictive as group chat or, or uh, social media, right? That was a super and, then, <laughs> and then down below that original message, I had, you know, what looked like the reply to the original message, which had all my information. And, you know, that just went through the roof. And we got so many replies on that. We had tech billionaires reaching out to us. We had some of the biggest uh, venture capital funds in the US reaching out to us. Uh, some folks were actually reaching out to us that I had never reached out to because they had caught wind from someone else who had caught wind that this company was raising money and they were moving and things were really hot, right? And so because I was able to have these conversations with, uh, with some of these really big funds, I was able to then structure the, the rest of the emails that went out, said, hey, you wanna hop on this quick? We're closing the round at the end of this month. So you've got like 20 days to move. Uh, we're already talking you know, with this billionaire and we're talking with this fund and we're talking with this VC fund in Silicon Valley and blah, 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 right? Deal heat galore, right? That was what we were after and that's really what matters. The FOMO, the FOMO right? The FOMO, you've got to drive that FOMO. That's what it comes down to. It's not really about how well your business is doing. It's about, um, it's really unfortunately about making them feel like they're going to miss out uh, because other people are going to come in. And uh, you know, we had a variety of tricks um, up our did sleeves. That, did, did that uh, work out uh, finally, Michael? It did. Yeah. So the short version is uh, we intended to raise uh, $600,000 uh, for what we needed to do. And we oversubscribed. Um, in fact, we raised almost everything within uh, a single month. And uh, we ended up raising almost $1.2 million. Um, that was awesome. Uh, congrats on that. Thanks. Uh, so, and then uh, what happened next? Well, that's kind of where we're at now. Like we, uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've done, um, we pulled in the 10th largest district in the U.S. We have uh, pulled in a, a handful of schools. Uh, we have built out our product even more extensively. We've redesigned what we've got. Uh, we've got this incredible roadmap for uh, our sales team and our customer experience team um, that we are just so excited for and so amped for. And I will tell you, it is just an incredible experience after going through all of that, you know, two years of no paycheck, okay, no real validation, no one paying us, no clients paying us. Um, and to get to this point where we finally have the capital that we need to act on the opportunity that we have. Because throughout all of this, the thing that's been driving us, even though we haven't had people paying for it, it's been the feedback. The feedback has been incredible. And the users that get in, they start recommending us to other users and other teachers. And like we've known that there is something here, but we've only had 
you know, the money that we were able to put in, which I think eventually we put in like $50,000 of our own funds. And you asked me where we got it. I don't know. I really don't. It was student loans. It was amazing friends and family that were just incredibly helpful. Um, and, you know, we're, I, I would never guess that we would have been able to put that kind of money together from our own, but it was, you know, it was really frustrating. Um, and now the dominoes are really falling. The things are really happening. We've had, again, the CRM that is just blowing up. We've got all these leads, but we didn't have enough bandwidth to pursue them and to uh, make things happen. And now we do, and we're just amped. We're so excited. That was awesome, Michael. I'm sure like in your story, that's exactly why you wanted to create this podcast to share these kind of stories because for budding entrepreneurs like me, especially in EdTech, it is super hard and super difficult. Just with your story, I, I'm sure like a lot of students, a lot of EdTech entrepreneurs uh, would like you know, definitely resonate because a lot of us are just getting started. And uh, with your story, you have like you know, really helped us understand like you know, what are those ins and outs of not just building a startup because it is the, the hardest thing to do. And uh, sometimes we just need entrepreneurs who are heading towards those goals to share their stories and just learning from their experiences is going to help us uh, really, really well. Yeah, you know, on that note, uh, Venki, I, that's one of the reasons why I really love the podcast that you're putting together because these stories matter. These stories make have made a significant difference in uh, my actions, right? Uh, there's a handful of, of podcasts that I listen to. Um, you're probably familiar with How I Built This by yeah, Guy Ross. Awesome. Yeah, <laughs> that is one of my favorite podcasts in big part. Yeah. He, he interviews these entrepreneurs that have been there and done that and have made, you know, gazillions of dollars, but he doesn't focus on the successes, mm. right? He focuses on the realities yes. because it does not matter what stage you're at in entrepreneurship. It does not matter if you're day one or year 10, the, the feeling that it's all going to collapse never goes away. And that's just one of the consistent themes I've seen both in my career in watching the invest, the um, entrepreneurs I've worked for and in listening to these podcasts, that feeling never goes away. Your ability to deal with that risk, your ability to, uh, to handle that stress is the difference between, you know, companies that make it and companies that don't. And you know, you often hear the question, why do businesses fail, right? And there are two reasons why businesses fail. There are only two reasons. doesn't matter what you're thinking of. It boils down to one of two reasons. You either A, run out of money, or B, you run out of grit, right? You either just don't have the money, you can't make it happen because you don't have the capital, or B, you give up, right? You want to move on. It's too hard. And you, it, rightfully so. It is, it is super hard. It is super challenging. And that was why from the very beginning, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur because it just, I looked at everything I could be doing and I said, that seems like the most challenging thing. That seems like the thing that is going to require me to sculpt my personality, to sculpt my attributes, to modify myself in a way that I can handle that stress, that I can be that gritty that I can work that hard. Like I want to be that guy. And I wasn't, and I'm, I'm not now. Like I, I, there's still so much more to go on that journey. Uh, but you know, there's it's grit and it's money and that's why businesses fail. And, uh, I, I think more often than not, it's grit that fails first. Absolutely. You're a hundred percent right there, Michael. And, uh, thanks for sharing all those, those moments because that's exactly what we need to listen and we need to be hearing because sometimes people might be thinking, Hey, these people are crazy going after this thing, which is not working for like two years. Like, you know, going to, I mean, I went through the same struggle and same stress and still going through it. And I, I thought like, Hey, I need to listen to other entrepreneurs who are in that moment doing it because that's what makes me have that grit back again, not to give it up. And I just wanted to share those stories just again to all the people so that they listen and see that everybody have to go this, through this journey. And for people who are thinking that it, it is not 
it is easy it's not right that's exactly what i wanted to show it to them so that they keep on that fire going on and thank you so much michael for having like you know your wonderful uh, time and like you know your uh, story and uh, sharing with us today and uh, where can people find you if they wanted to reach out to you and learn more about literal and uh, what you guys are up to yeah uh definitely check out the website it's literalapp.com and uh go in sign up you can there's some free reading that you can do um and then yeah you can feel free to reach out to me uh uh, yeah, feel free to reach out to me. I think my email is actually in the contact us form um, on the site. So uh, if you fill that out, it'll go right to me and I'm, or you can reach out on LinkedIn as well. LinkedIn's a great place. And, uh, you know, I, I, I want to be helping others as much as I have been helped. It's way easier said than done. Um, but it is probably the next, you know, area that I am working on personally as it, you know, as an individual, um, is trying to be less selfish with my time, right? To make sure I'm, I'm really helping those around me, uh, which is one of the things, Venki, that I think you do so well as part of this podcast, putting this content out there. Um, you know, it, it is incredibly inspirational for those of us that are in the trenches each day. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. Uh, I'm sure like a lot of people are going to enjoy your story. And uh, since like you guys are just about to break that big barriers like you got the investment and we wish you all the very best for all those great success stories that you're going to make in the years to come wonderful thank you so much